Okay. So I think we're ready to start now. All right. So welcome. Thanks for joining. We're going to focus in on, um, first of all, uh, dissecting a specimen record page, a specimen detail page. This may be a little bit review for some folks, but uh, it's a good way to introduce you to the parts that we're going to be highlighting throughout the um, talk. So we're going to uh, first spend about um, the first half doing that and looking at the publicly available pages. So everything here are things that you can see if you're um, a public member. And then in the second half, we're going to uh, drill into some of the unique Arctos features, um, which help us um, manage and track uh, grant activities like uh, large NSF digitization awards um, and other research projects. So we'll talk about projects specifically. Uh, we'll also uh, point out um, how we track publications that cite vouchers um, and how those are linked in Arctos. We'll also point out um, linking specimens to external databases like GenBank, Morphosaurus, GBIF, and the like. Um, we will also point out um, how Arctos is uh, really innovative in linking specimens to each other in order to capture biological interactions. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, and then we'll uh, end with um, how we use Arctos um, as uh, an observation catalog as well. So oftentimes um, in the modern herpetological collections, there are needs sometimes to have a way to uh, record um, species occurrences, but we, but we don't, for whatever reason, have maybe the full physical vouchers, um, but instead we have a media-based um, voucher for those specimens. So we'll talk about that. And if we have time, we'll also um, review some search tips, tricks and tips, and um, how to see uh, different ways of seeing uh, search results. And um, please end, ask questions as we go along and, um, and in the chat or just verbally. Um, and we'll try to accommodate them or we'll save them for the end, depending on um, what, we're, uh, what we're discussing. So I'm gonna let Carol now um, guide us through a specimen detail page. So take it away, Carol. Okay, great, thanks, Michelle. Hi, everybody. If I talk too fast, Michelle, just tell me to slow down. So uh, we have a lot to cover. Um, <laughs> okay, so at the top of the page, I just wanted to go over, you can see um, the GWID, the GWID for the specimen, MVZ, HERP, 258410, which is also included in the link. We make every specimen in Arctos, not just MBZ, has um, that kind of a permanent link that links directly to the specimen number. So that's very useful for link outs and link backs. Um, you can see at the top, it, there's the identification that's currently, what the specimen is currently identified as. The, um, uh, above that, there's a little uh, just short uh, uh, locality information. And then next to that are the parts, and we'll explain more about that in a second. Um, so under identification, I wanted to, we picked this example because it actually shows several identifications. Um, I think the original was from 2008, was when the specimen came in, it was cataloged. Um, and Ali Katnazi, and it should have, I guess I cataloged it as the new species name, um, but usually it'll have something like a Bryophrenes spa to begin with. And then when the paper comes out, I'll add the new species name. So this is really useful for people that have a lot of different um, identification changes over time, like, you know, let's say for the toads, the bufonids, a lot of those have changed, frogs. You can show the old identifications, and this is super helpful for you to see if there was some question about why an animal was called what it was, um, who identified it, so you can know if it's a person that really knows what they're talking about. And, um, and also, you know, maybe the specimen was still in the collection under the old name, so it's useful to see what um, previous identifications are. So it basically keeps all that in there. Um, this is a type, so um, go up a little bit, Michelle. So you can see that, uh, no, go up, uh, sorry, go up in the identifications, because I wanted to show, this one um, actually shows you that it was a, a identification sent to the paper, the citation, because that was where the name was originally described. Um, and, uh, and this paper will show you in a minute, but has multiple uh, identifications that are associated with the paper. So that's actually the, where the taxonomy comes from. Um, so it's a paratype. Um, 
and uh, and then we even put you can put in the page numbers that appears and then people can even go to the DOI for the papers that have DOIs in, in Arctis. Okay, so the next thing I want to show are media. And so for this media, we have, um, these are all photos from Cal Photos that are basically sort of scraped and, and then brought, they have link outs from Cal Photos back to MVZ, the MVZ page. And, um, and then they appear as thumbnails on the specimen detail pages. Um, and so we have, basically we have, there's a lot of flexibility that goes on with uh, media. So media can come from like Cal Photos, can come directly from uh, the Arctos, which the images are stored in TAC, the Texas uh, Advanced Computing Center, uh, or from really multiple sources. And you can either see them here in the media, or you can see them sometimes in the link outs, which I'll explain more in a second. Um, one thing I'm sorry I forgot to mention is that anybody can have an Arctos login. And so what we're seeing right now is a public page um, that's, and most of the things we're going to show in the beginning here are anything that the public can see online. But basically when we're curating, we see the exact same thing. We just see a few more columns at the top that allow you to do editing features, et cetera. So anybody can have though an Arctos login. If you have certain ways, things you like to search on or things you like to appear when you're doing searches, you can save in a login so you can look at those all the time. Okay, so then go back down to, um, so the next thing we want to show are localities. Michelle's going to talk about that for a second. Okay, so yeah, so I, another thing that we should just mention, I don't know if people have started noticing this, but there's these faint little boxes around these different fields. And so each one of these little faint boxes actually um, indicates sort of a, a table or a set of tables that are related to some something in common. So um, now that we're, you know, moving on from the media, we're looking now at, at anything that related to the spatial um, attributes for this specimen. So here's the location. You can see the higher geography. You can actually see the verbatim locality and then the um, specific locality as well as the coordinates. Um, you can no you notice that there's this green box. We'll be showing you some other specimens. You may notice that this green box sometimes is yellow, sometimes it's green. This means it's been verified by um, either curator or uh, through the collector. So in this case, it was verified by the collector and so um, it, it, it gets a, an accepted uh, verification status. And, um, and then you can see the uh, um, actual specimen mapped out. So that's a tiny thumbnail. If I were to click on that, I can open up a Berkeley Mapper instance and um, actually see it um, in, in um, a, uh, interactive map and you can actually see this in a couple different ways. If we zoom in a little bit you can also see the um, uncertainty uh, radius, radius um, displayed as well. And there's some you know some options here. Uh, you can also download it. it usually um, specimen um, results may have lots of other points associated with it if you're doing a search. So this Berkeley mapper interface gives you a, a little bit more of control over that. So. Go ahead, Carol. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about the collectors or um, agents as we call them in Arctos. So one thing I didn't mention is that many things are shared across all the collections in Arctos. So things such as um, taxonomy, the specimen identifications, the um, media, uh, the localities and geography, um, basically and agents especially um, are shared across everybody in Arctos. So anybody can use these agents and in other institutions and that way there's sort of a verification going on to sort of show that it's the same person. Um, and so first we're gonna show, uh, we're just gonna talk a little bit about Alessandro Katnazi. So he's a shared agent across collections. And so if you go to the public page for him, you can see um, it has information about, you can put in information when we edit about who he studied with, with Mary Power and Mo Donnelly. And you can see how many specimens he's given to uh, the MBZ collections. Um, you can also, if he had deposited specimens at other collections, you would see those listed here too, like UCM, um, M MSB, etc. So uh, you can see how much media he's associated, and then you can also see any publications. Um, and so these do have to be um, added into the database, the publications, but then you can add the DOI pretty easily to get the publications to show up and then add the agent so they're associated with him. And then, um, and then you can see with publications, there's nine citations. And so we're we gonna click on that for a second. Yeah, click on the, the top one, Michelle. Or oh, I'm we... sorry, what, what was that? The, the publication. Did we, okay. 
Maybe not. I mean, we were going to show a different publication, I think. Oh, here we yeah, go. But you can see there's nine cited specimens, which are specimens that are actually mentioned as vouchers in the, um, or, or as types. And then um, also these are sensu because they're, they're specimens that are actually named, the new names come from that paper. So you can see there were three new names from that paper that were added to database, the database. Okay, so let's go back to the record. Yeah, and this is just a common feature for Arctos. Whenever you're seeing these blue links, they, they are hyperlinked to, you know, what that asset um, is actually uh, uh, indicating. So as, wherever possible, we try to link back to actual specimens, like I just showed you, to actual publications, you know, uh, maybe to the, either the external publication, um, DOI, um, or if it's been uploaded because not every uh, journal has an open access PDF, um, we, uh, a curator may have uploaded um, a PDF of that publication. And we'll show you more examples of that. So next field are identifiers. So identifiers are basically where the field number goes. This is also where um, a GenBank number will go, which we'll show you in a future thing. And also, um, especially if we have links to other collections, let's say this was, um, a parent of another animal or it had a parasite at another collection, there will be link outs to other MVZ or like here at Cal Academy or here at MVZ, we have a lot of Cal Academy specimens where we have the tissues here and part of an accession will be a Calicad and they'll have the whole animals. And so um, if so collections that are you can put the Cal Academy number here and then collections that are in Arctos, you will actually have the links back to those collections. Um, and we'll show you some examples of that specifically. So under links, this is where um, the GBIF occurrence goes, I do bio, anything that has a link out that isn't one of the ones I've mentioned already. Also for Morphosource, when those CT scans are added, that's where a link will be to Morphosource in the future. Um, and so this is the GBIF record. You can see basically it's showing the same kind of information and it has a link back to MBZ and they even have um, inf more information about the locality and then they have the specimen photos. Um, then yeah, so, so Arctos has um, automated harvesting through an IPT to both GBIF and IDBio. So these are not, these are done automatically. And then for attributes, um, it only shows two here. We sort of have standard ones that we try to have for everything, but um, those aren't always recorded. But for this one, we did know it was a juvenile, and you can see that that's associated with uh, Alessandro, and he identified it as that um, when he collected the specimen. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot more attributes that you can, you can basically add any attribute you want. Like if it's a snap vent length, tail length, um, any kind of measurements you want can be added into this. There's, it's basically a ton of information that you can add. Um, so, and then we're gonna look at the accession. So the accessions are typically not, the accession is actually donation of these specimens when they were given to us. Typically these are kept private, but we made one public. This was a gift, but oftentimes we'll have um, specimens that are obtained from a field project, so that would be a big accession of animals. In this case, this was a gift of um, specimens, amphibians he gave us from Peru for cataloging as types to be put into a publication. And so you can see information about um, uh, the specimen remarks, uh, which ones were cataloged. I sort of just do a little summary here and what I put the MVZ numbers into and just it's part, it helps me check. So these estimate, these counts and things, some of them are automated and then some of them I put in, and so it's a way for me to check the accession. You can see the permits. Um, another thing that I typically put in with the accession too is if tissues or other parts are kept at a different institution, I'll put in information about that here. And, um, and then you can get to the Berkeley mapper of all the specimens, and then you can see these great thumbnails at the bottom too for all the animals that were donated. So. Yeah, so we were, we were lucky because Ollie kept pretty careful track of specimens and uh, um, photographs. Um, let's see, are we ready to look at the Carcinia? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to move on to another example of another famous herp species. Uh, yeah. Do you want to um, continue now with the, this example? Yeah, I think the only things that I really want to point out that are different are, well, in this case, you can see that it was cited in two different papers, and we actually have the DOI to the Vietas paper. Um, so it was a paratype in the first paper, and then the later publication, it was actually a voucher tissue. Um, and so it has the information about that. And because it was a voucher tissue sample that was on sequence, we actually have um, 
we don't have a part here. Yeah, because the tissue, that's eh, a long story. Anyway. <laughs> we, uh, well, we have other examples. There are always mistakes. There's a tissue somewhere. It's just never been cataloged. Um, but, uh, Whoops. Just, <laughs> but, uh, who knows what but we'll look at the GenBank record because you can yeah. still get to the sequence. Yeah. So here, so, I just picked the first one. Um, anyway, so people have looked at GenBank records before, I assume, but um, here's the link to the sequences. So that's sort of the cool thing is you can link directly. And then it, if a person puts in the GUID correctly from Arctos, so the MBZ colon herp, it'll automatically click, make the link out back to Arctos. So the actual GenBank link that exists in, on the Arctos page, I have to make but we actually get notifications Sorry. about those and it'll tell us like you have so many GenBank records that you haven't attached to your specimens, which I have tons, but, um, but then people can always find the link out from GenBank is basically created automatically if, if they cite the specimen correctly. Right. Um, so that's important. And then, um, and you can see it was a David Wake specimen. And then one cool thing is you can see all these different attributes, which I pulled from the paper. Um, you can actually put those in for everything. It was a gravid female. And then, um, and then the next thing is, so because we're logged in as public, you guys can't see what loans were used um, for this specimen, but because, um, but you can see that there was a project associated with it. And so the project is the um, Overt project being run out of uh, David Blackburn's lab. And um, we have our own NSF award as a sub award here at, at MBZ as many institutions do. Um, and uh, so this is sort of where we jump into projects then. And so I want to say that the use of projects, there's many different uses of projects in Arctos, but this is sort of the glue that binds everything together. And I find it super useful for using in these big digitization projects, um, especially when you have to do your yearly reports or your final reports. Um, a lot of these things in here are actually generated by Arctos for you. Um, it also can, you can put in the award number, so you always remember that for future use. You can put in the timing of the grant exactly, um, and you can put in um, the link to the grant on NSF. And so this is both the link, I think the 1714 is the link to the, the yeah, um, there, it's NSF project for, for Dave Blackburn for Florida, and then the other link is the link to the, the MBZ. You can also put in uh, direct links to things like Morphosource, which is where all the data, the CT scans are going to be stored. Um, and because we've attached loans to this, you can see all the catalog records used. And so this information here that Michelle's pointing out, all of that is automatically generated by Arctos because I attached those specimens to loans attached to a project. Okay. So there's multiple loans made to several institutions that are doing the CT scanning, and then they basically just get um, totaled for me. So then every year I know how many specimens we've sent out that year. Um, it also keeps track of like the funding that you originally received for this project. Um, yeah. And then the other cool thing is under projects contributing records. So these are the, in the 26 projects that are associated with accessions that um, were given to MBZ that um, are associated. So you can see that they have MBZ specimens from Vietnam, the Maria Viaco project, et cetera. All these different projects are all projects that um, collected specimens. The project is associated with an accession and then that is then connected to this. So I didn't generate any of this, it's automatically generated from Arctos for me. So you can see that there's a lot of projects from all over the world that really gave this. And then um, I think next we're gonna talk about Omezo, right? Yeah, so yeah. just before we jump into back into the projects, um, I just wanted to point out, I think this one, there was a, uh, you wanted to show um, about relationships. No, we're gonna do that at the, later i think right okay so we'll okay we'll talk did about I, did that. I skip relationships sorry uh, okay Keep yes going. yes we did but we can talk about that later so that was the only other thing okay so uh, let's okay. let's take a look now at what these uh what some of these look like when you're logged in so uh which is why i needed to have two different um things so you can see now that i'm actually logged in here um, as a curator, so you, uh, the only difference again, Car like Carol mentioned, you know, I've got more tabs, I've got more control over things. So I'm just going to open this up, and um, so now you're seeing what a, a curator sees. Um, so now there's edit functions. Um, we have associated a uh, this particular um, a salamander with its um, digimorph uh, link out, um, and you can now see uh, the a number of um, you want to talk about this a little bit about the loans? 
Yeah, okay. and so this, this um, was from over. go up to go up a little bit, Michelle. Sorry, I'll, and um, so for this specimen, you can see it's one of the animals that we sent out for um, scanning from over. It also previously been sent out for the Digimorph project. So eventually, under this links tab where it says Jeep of Nidig Bio, there'll also be sort of an automatically generated Morphosource link um, that'll take you to the CT scan images on. Um, and so it's been scanned twice. And so right now you can see the Digimorph scan. All the Digimorph scans are also going to be available on Morphosaurus through Overt too. So, but here we can see when I was telling you the projects for Overt, you can see, click to see the loan list. Um, and so if you click on that, you can see there's, uh, it's been sent for multiple places. And, um, and a lot of it is for, we sent some paratypes for scanning um, for to Dave Blackburn for Overt. So go back to that record. Um, so here I can just mention, since we didn't talk about this previously, so you can see currently that there's still um, two open, how can there be two? Okay, well great, we didn't check this one ahead of time. So you always <laughs> find mistakes when you're looking at things. <laughs> a specimen can't be on two loans at the same time if it's a whole animal. But um, I think this one animal, I know what it is, one, this animal was returned from the 2004 loan and then it was sent out again for the 2018 loan and both were CT scans. So it's just other animals on the 2004 loan haven't been returned. So that's why the loan is still open. But um, one aspect also I wanted to show you guys that you can see if you're logged in under parts. And actually, you can think you can see it if you're not logged in also, is you can see the whole path. And so this is very brief, but we can, uh, for any part, a tissue, or really any whole animal, you can use barcodes to track its location in your collections. And so in this case, we have a barcoded hierarchical system for our tissue freezers. They're in, um, you can see the room number, you can see the barcoded freezer number, LN2 freezer one. Then you, you can see um, then the barcoded racks, freezer boxes, and uh, cryobiles, and then even the positions within that are, are um, available to look at on Arctos. And so all those things can help you track your tissue collections, or you can use it for whole animals, like you could barcode your jars on your shelf, et cetera and um, you could track specimens and have, so that's what this PL path and container is. So the container is actually the barcode associated with it. It's not the, it's not the MBZ number. And then the path shows you the whole, you know, shebang about where it is in our collection. Should we get back to projects then? Yes. Okay, so this is the projects, Carol. Do you wanna talk about this? Uh, you, you mentioned loans being associated here. So that's why I needed to get into a, um, permitted, um, permissioned um, view of this so we can show you some of the behind the scenes of a project. So um, projects like we mentioned before, there's a lot of flexibility on how and what you what you have. So you can see the HTML block, you can see how we list folks. And here's all the project uh, loans associated um, with this project, which generates the dynamic list. And you can see it's across collections. The only thing that hasn't been loaned out for, for over from MEZ are fish, basically. So it's everything else. Um, including loans we actually haven't sent because of COVID. So, <laughs> or loans okay. haven't extended because of COVID. So, and then when publications come out associated with any of these specimens or any of these projects, you can just add them to the publication, to the, uh, the pot project. So we'll show you more about that in a second. Okay. okay, we have one more project to show you and then um, two more projects. Sorry. So I also wanted this is a linked project to the over. This is um, being run by Emily. She's the one of the uh, PIs for the Omezo project, which is uh, doing scanning of Mesoamerican herp herps for as a pen to overt. And so it has the links again, it has a description from the abstract. And then this one is exciting because it actually um, shows you all the CT scans that have been done at uh, UCM. And so there'll be also in the future loans associated with this. So loans that are going from MBZ to UCM will attach to the same project. Because remember again, these are shared across Arctos institutions. So all of us can see these and add to them. And um, it shows you the original funding again. And so it's sort of cool. You can actually see all the media right here um, with the project itself too. Yeah. And then okay. this is another great example right. of linked projects. Go ahead. So. so this was super helpful for me, especially because this is a big uh, CSBR grant that we got at MBZ a few years ago that was to um, add uh, new housing for our bird collections and also catalog a lot of orphaned collections that have been given to MBZ over the years. 
Um, and so, uh, and you can see one of the sort of interesting things I think is it shows you the project was funded for and has the amount that we were funded for, but it also has supportive projects were funded. So any projects that, that basically were cataloged as part of this, um, if, uh, or use specimens from the, these animals that were cataloged, will show you supported projects funds. And so this 808,000 is actually the overt money. Um, that's showing up in here. And so that'll keep, you know, that's automatically generated those numbers. Um, right. So as more projects uh, are dependent on this particular uh, CSBR um, activity, the, this number may increase over time. Um, and it shows you so the catalog records used are animals that we actually um, loaned to the project for this because these are shown in a display right now. We have two of these Hildebrand, which are um, sort of dried and skeletal preparations that come from, that were donated from UC Davis. They weren't cataloged as part of this, but we're using them in a display out in our sort of public area. And so we have two, a Phrynosoma and a Heloderma that are uh, talking about this, this grant in a display. But the sort of most exciting thing to me is the catalog records contributed. So these are animals where for this, instead of adding a loan to these projects, I've added accessions. So as we've been cataloging specimens as part of this grant, we added all the different accessions that were cataloged. And this so I think our expected was like 19,000 herps and we were able to get almost 24,000 herps done. So um, here, here are those accessions right here. Yeah, so it is a ton. So it was tons of different birds and um, a lot of herps accessions that were completed as part of this. And then, um, yeah, and then those were, and we still have a few that we're finishing up after the fact. So we go okay. back to the did, other page. Did I scroll fast enough there? Yeah, that was good. <laughs> I think that's good. They've seen a lot about the projects. Uh, go down. There was something else on the bottom. Oh, okay. The other sort of exciting thing is so a lot of these projects were things that were collected a long time ago. And because of that, many of them had publications already associated with these specimens, but the specimens weren't yet available publicly to anyone. They couldn't see the specimens. So because there were so many things that were already public already publications that came out, there were actually 117 pubs associated with projects that use specimens that were cataloged as part of this. And so a lot of, uh, you can see Malaysian, Indonesian things, um, a lot of things from Mount St. Helens. We got a lot of specimens donated to us from Mount St. Helens after uh, the 1980 um, explosion, you know, the volcanic eruption. And then one of the really cool things I wanted to show you was um, specimens from Wilbur Mayhew. He was a, a, pr a professor at UC Riverside. He published a lot on the amphibians and reptiles, that he, mostly uh, reptiles that he gave us. Um, he was one of the people that started the California Reserve System. And he published a buttload on these animals. And if you go to the accession, you can actually see um, as part of this CSBR grant, we were also able to scan all his field notes. He has a lot of physiological data associated with them and people can go there and they can actually click directly to the field notes on the internet archive. So, um, yeah. So here's the, here's the, his pr project and here's more information on another website about him and then his uh, scan field notes right here. So projects are basically this giant thing that sort of attaches accessions, loans, um, other projects, uh, grants as projects, everything to each other and to the specimens. And so we really use them a lot. Yeah, then, so they, they give context to activities. Yeah. The final thing is I just want to briefly show you if somebody comes and visits your collection, I haven't been as good about this, but Carla is great in our bird collection. You can make a loan <laughs> for their use in the collections. And so if they have specimens that they're measuring and looking at, in this case, they, um, Xavier came and he identified a lot of specimens and their stomach contents. He did a lot of measurements. Um, and so the catalog records actually show tons of attributes that he measured. He actually identified all the stomach contents, which for the most part in the herps, we keep the stomach contents as a part within herpetology, even if it's like a mammal. And so you can see it's a... Um, so a, I just picked one of them. Yeah, from that the, list of 32. Amias that he identified as the stomach content. So that's on record as being um, associated with this animal. It's in a different jar, but it's in the, the herp collection. Um, and then you can see the link to the feeding ecology project that we just showed you. And then here's the loan list. So he borrowed both the, um, it's a closed loan from, I had to make it 2021 because I realized there wasn't a loan already on, on the books, but he came and visited in like 2006. So all the specimens from that that visit that he used for the publication are now uh, part of a loan too. So we use project, that's probably my most common thing that I use projects for is for loans. We make a loan a project for every loan that we send out or that's, that's used here. Yeah, okay. okay. 
then let's go back to relationships since I skipped that. Michelle. Okay. So yeah, so that's a good thing about, uh, about all these tabs. We have plenty of examples. So yeah, I mentioned relationships earlier. So um, we'll dive into that a little bit more. This example was sort of fun because um, this shows how we can relate two different Arctos uh, specimens to each other. In this case, they have a relationship of um, prey, of, of, of uh, eaten by uh, predator prey. And uh, what this is um, actually demonstrating is uh, both an example from our archives, but also the, um, how Arctos can kind of keep everything uh, it, uh, linked together. So in this case, we had a dicamptodon larva that was actually um, a photographed um, eating, I don't know if you can see it, he's underwater, here's the uh, individual, and here he is eating, in the process of eating this garter snake. And this um, event was um, described in uh, sort of almost minute by minute detail by Gordon Gillian in 1949, um, which we actually wrote about in this publication. So Jackie Childers is one of our graduate students. Um, and uh, so this was a lot of fun to, to do um, and to mark. So here, in this case, we decided to, the, the, the snake itself was actually cataloged separately. So here it is cataloged here. And um, because of this relationship of Eaton, he's, he's the eaten by, and here's the, uh, I mean, he's the eight rather, and uh, the, the um, salamander larva was the eaten by um, relationship. Now these relationships, anything that's uh, listed here gets harvested into the Global Biotic um, Interaction Database, GLOBI. Um, it, some folks may know about uh, GLOBI. So, um, and then, and, and this helps inform basically um, documented species um, interactions. Um, the publication itself, you can read if you're interested by again, those, those hyperlinks. Um, this is a Herp Review article, so I just went ahead and uploaded the PDF, but you can actually read in gory detail um, the whole uh, episode. Um, so this was the first documentation of um, uh, evidence of this, of this particular uh, salamander larva, which get quite large, um, actually eating a snake. Uh, it's usually the other way around if you're not a herpetologist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, but it's not the only relationship that we can show. Um, we can also show things like um, parent um, uh, offspring relationships. So in this case, we have a uh, large female um, uh, Limnonectes larvipartis frog um, and her um, tadpoles were cataloged um, separately, but we can indicate that relationship um, through these hyperlinks. And again, this is now, um, shared with um, Globy. And go to the bottom of that one, Michelle. I just wanted to show. And uh, because like in this case, the top, well, the tadpoles were cataloged as a lot. And so you can see I put quantity. So it was 17 tadpoles in one lot. Um, I usually also put a remark about that. But, um, but uh, you know, these are limnonectes army fighters are the ones that give birth to live tadpoles instead of laying eggs. And so, um, so we have a quite, I've used this quite a lot with our Indonesian specimens because we have a lot of tadpoles. That were collected in the field with the with the mother, and so you're able to keep that link linkage going. And so that's probably the most common usage I have for the relationship. But relationships can also be a cross collection. So let's say if you have parasites for a specimen that are at a different a different Arctos collection, then you can link across collections here. So there's been a lot of examples, like in the mammals, between uh, parasites in one collection. Or yeah, one. host parasites a very mm -hmm. common one as well. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, we should just take a, 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 a quick little check-in. Do we, are there any questions? Oh, we covered a, a lot very quickly, I felt, so. Yeah, sorry, uh, we're not too fast. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're happy to um, take any questions, go back to anything that you saw earlier. Are you, I, don't, I can't see the chat window, so somebody will have to let me know if there's, if there's okay. one. Uh, yeah, I guess we can, I don't think there's, I think James is trying to type, but we can also take questions at the end if that's. Yeah, you can just unmute yourself too. I, 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 uh, this isn't like a formal thing. 
Okay. Uh, so, so, so yeah, I haven't actually, I don't think I've attended, I might've attended one of the first Arctos um, webinars, but so, so when you update your records from your, like from your internal um, cat like database, is it, is, does it like automatically publish it to, to this web portal that you can see everything and like, can yeah, you, like, absolutely. Yeah. The web portal is our database essentially. So yes, um, when we update anything here, um, it becomes publicly available. Now for a couple, I, you know, I say that uh, with just a couple of caveats, there's a few things, there's a few kinds of updates that may need to go through some um, back-end processing. So there may be, you know, it may take five minutes or, or so to, to, to reappear. Um, in the in the public portal um so not everything's like instantaneous but it's more or less pretty much um uh live so what we see here on the public page is is the live data and so this is like where you would also enter new records mm -hmm. yeah, yes so we didn't, that's right we didn't talk about data entry or any of that really but yeah, so we have an entire suite of um, data entry um, options. So you can um, uh, add things in one by one. Um, I can, do you want me to show a quick example of that? Yeah, so, show the data entry screen. Okay, so, the, um, oops, sorry, that's, that's my browser, so just ignore that. Um, so here, let's go to a HERP record. And uh, you can see, sorry about my, Firefox being, I haven't fixed all the permissions on my Firefox. So you can see that um, this is uh, what um, a data entry screen typically looks like. So it's pretty much your standard, you know, every field. There's a few things that help um, things uh, move along a little faster. So if I put in um, like uh, Carol Spencer, let's say I don't know exactly how she uh, spells Carol. Um, there's actually a pop-up window that you probably can't see, but I can um, pick from the pop-up window um, the exact data entry. And then once I have that there, I can also then also copy that throughout um, the other um, attributes here. So, um, yeah, so you can enter in everything that we've described in the dissection of our specimen detail page. And... Um, there's a lot of uh, code tables, so there's no, so there, so you're basically picking from a pick list um, to help uh, reduce errors. Um, but there's also a lot of things that you can um, decide to do later. So you can decide to add in um, maybe the uh, georeferencing later on, um, or the attributes later on, or the other sort of you know um, publication sort of things later on. You can always come back to this. Um, it, uh, the yellow ones are the things that, you know, you can pick from a pick list and um, the white fields are ones that are either uh, um, controlled vocabulary or um, free text. Um, is there anything you want to mention specifically, Carol? Um, I don't use this data entry screen that often because I'm usually bulk loading, so. Sure, let's take I, a look at, you have, you have lots of bulk loading yeah. options too. Yeah. So there's a bulk load builder because you have very specific fields and the, the uh, information in there, you know, has to match things that are in our pick list, right? So agents, geography, um, taxonomy, you can't just misspell a name or the country or a species. They have to match something that's already in Arctos. Yeah. Um, but so here, uh, just show that real, so you can build your own template. Yeah, so you can sort of pick the fields you want in your template. I have sort of a set one already and then you download it into, I use Google Docs, but a lot of people use Excel to do the, the actual building. And so if you have um, basically files from your collectors or we type it all in from their field notes and then, um, and then we make sure that it matches the controlled vocabulary for all those fields for taxonomy, geography, you know, so there, and then there's obviously verbatim fields that you can write exactly what the collectors wrote. So that's how I do most of my data entry is we have, like for Indonesia, we'll have 5,000 specimens and so we're making these giant, um, huge Google Docs, basically. And that's what I have the students all working on, you know, all semester. And then, uh, so some things, um, 
in that data entry screen that Michelle was showing, some things that I have set to repeat, like if I'm making a whole bunch of data entry like that at once, it like catalog numbers, I, I don't have repeat, I have to type that in myself, but um, like the locality information and the person who collected it and stuff, all of those things I can have um, repeated through, uh, through multiple data entry screens. So. Right, because it's Basically, the same person. Whole, yeah, yeah. So our whole database is, you're seeing it. The only difference between the public thing we've been showing and this is you, there's a login. No. Yeah. Um, yeah, so everything that you've seen here um, was those boxes, matches boxes. Yeah. Basically, they go with code ta tables that match the data entry screen. Yeah. Right. Now, and then, you know, as things are, um, as activities are noted, um, like we were showing the linkages, these things like the usages, these just uh, are dynamically pulled and generated and they just get um, added on through time as people keep associating these specimens with um, activities. So when we're doing data entry, I wouldn't put in one of these projects. I would add it to the accession and then as specimens get added to the accession itself, there's a unique accession number then they would get added automatically to the project. And so that's why you can see that for, you know, Indonesia, I have multiple different projects going on for these specimens. And, uh, and that's because those projects are all attached to the multiple accessions for Indonesia, so. Yeah. Um, okay. okay. I guess um, we can, go yeah, ahead. That, so sorry, that's a good question there. Yeah. yeah. Because we didn't give a lot of the background because I felt like a lot of that's been given in some of the other ARCTIS, but I know people haven't, you know, always been able to make all the other ARCTIS webinars. Um, uh, oh, we yeah. didn't want to show observational data. Yeah, so I was just going to say that I think there's one other thing that um, uh, we have on our list, but that's a great question. Is there anything else? To, I mean, before we get into the very end of our, of our, uh, you know, outlined presentation, because we're happy to obviously divert <laughs> um, anything that's useful to you guys okay if not then um we can save more th things to the end and we'll uh, talk about observations so we started this uh um, a couple of years ago um, but in arctos um, basically the way we've been treating it is as a separate collection in um uh all associated with obviously MVZ. And this just helps with a couple of different things. It helps with, um, uh, you know, um, defining who's sort of in charge of it. It defines, you know, basically, you know, when people, are, you can ex easily exclude searches um, for MVZ OBS because then you know that there's no voucher. So don't bother asking me for a tissue, for instance. Um, so in this case, this was our, our first one, and I just wanted to uh, point this out. This was you. This was a um, a uh, sighting of a um, California king snake um, set outside of its range. It generated a, a herp review range extension, um, which is cited here, and um, you can see here that you know we are able to. Um, uh, um, still keep, do the same things that um, a specimen, a regular vouchered specimen would have. But in this case, the only voucher we have is the media. So we've, so this f fell under um, our archive um, uh, um, TAC repository, not CalPhotos. And uh, though we do share these thumbnails with CalPhotos, but this allows us to have high resolution um, copies of these images um, separate from the, the web resolution thumbnails um, just in case um, and we still have a, um, a, uh, a detailed um, specimen record but I'm logged in right now so you're seeing all the gory details I'll ha hide them again from the screen but um, uh, we've actually have this encumbered right now just the location um, because it is an Report. animal that Pardon? The coordinates. The coordinates, just yeah. the coordinates, just because um, they are, uh, it's, a, it's an animal with high poaching uh, availability, but the public does not see this. So if I were to log out, um, those coordinates would be just uh, wiped out. So only the, the, cor the, um, the curators 
uh, with the right permissions can see that right now. Um, so that's one example. Um, but um, I, I wanted to mention you can encumber anything. So you can basically hide the identification, you could hide the entire locality, and only someone who's logged into our collection would be able to see it then. So you can encumber as much information as you want. And we yeah, that's, that. a, that's a good point. You can actually encumber the whole record too. So, um, uh, yeah, so uh, besides uh, photos though, um, some of our um, observations are vouchered through media. Um, and I was told that when I play this, you guys can't hear it because I don't know, I don't have my Zoom tuned in properly, but you know, you can, this embedded um, MP3 player can actually, you can listen to the, to the frog calls here yourself. Um, so this is a, this was one, um, that was retrieved from a different um, uh, project. And obviously Ned Johnson's more known for uh, observing birds, but in this case, uh, he also um, has some uh, frog calls here. So this is, uh, um, you know, you, you can kind of see some of the um, information here, how it really doesn't differ in the structure, just what we show for um, observations. Um, so, and so other yeah, questions ahead, at MBZ, for example, I think the um, the mammal collection, if it just has like DNA for an animal and doesn't have anything else, like we in herps, we would actually catalog that as a regular herp collection specimen, but um, they catalog that as a MBZ OBS for mammals. Um, so you can basically have anything as an OBS that you decide is how you're going to catalog your observations. And so in this case, we just for herps, we rec anything that's a either only a photograph or only a video or just an observation without anything and that isn't associated with um with this actual specimen gets cataloged as an observation yeah MBZ OBS. So. yeah so um now we're going to move into bone our bonus tips but before we do uh, which is basically about um how to get the best out of your searching Arctos experience. Um, but before we do that, are there any other questions about cataloging, um, specimen details, linkages, interrelationships between um, records or assets, um, whatever, uh, before we get into our uh, specimens? Can I ask a quick one? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. This is, this is Nick Harris. It's a little bit of an aside, but I haven't sat in on any of these chats before. For um, for those of us that have received loans and then we get a publication from them, what um, what's the easiest thing to provide to the curators that gave us tissues that will allow them to do things quickly? That's a great question, Carol. Yeah. Uh, do you mean what did what it provided the curators to get the tissues or after the fact? After so once it once the oh. publication is oh, out, okay. so all the leaking projects and everything that you guys have gone through. This what, is your what time to. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's your time to shine, Carol. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've talked a lot about this. <laughs> we actually were talking about this with some collector, some people today. So the best thing for us is if you cite the actual MBZ GUIDs and that, you know, that three part GUID in the publication somewhere, either an appendix or as a dryad file that's attached to the publication. Um, that's in terms of the actual specimens itself. So if you have like I, some of those stomach content things, they, they mentioned like they acknowledge us but they don't actually mention all the specimens used. And, and it's really helpful if the specimens used are mentioned some the actual specimen number. So even for people that are doing, let's say GIS research and they're using a ton of our stuff from GBIF to have a big file that shows all the specimen numbers because then we can attach them to the publication. But the other big thing with GenBank is sort of a giant pain. Um, I know for a lot of people. And so if you're publishing things to GenBank, make sure to put that MBZ Quit or you know the Arctis quit. It doesn't matter if it's MBZ. That three-part MBZ colon her colon the number. You know, for all of our, our, everybody in Arctis has something like that. And so make sure you put that in uh, GenBank when you submit your information to GenBank because then it'll automatically link out and then it creates sort of this internal um, little notice to us also under reports that shows us that there's GenBank links to our specimens. And so then we know, to, and, and obviously sending the paper back to the collection too, um, so they know it came out. But does that answer your question, Nick? Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Yay, thank you for asking that. I was just so many say, people that publish that either won't even thank us or they'll thank us and then they don't bother mentioning the specimens used and we're all like, what? 
Yeah, I, I would skip the thanks if they would just give us a specimen yeah. list. And the biggest thing with GenBank is that because we're not the people that are giving the records to GenBank, I can't make changes to GenBank, even if they cite the wrong identification for an animal. We've had that multiple times and it's been really problematic. So it's really helpful. And I think the easiest way now is like something like a dryad or repository service is um, if they won't allow you to put an appendix with your, um, with your publication, so, okay. Yeah, no, that that's really it's it's also I hopefully becoming more and more common that people realize if they want museums to be around for the future, then you got to help support us show other folks, especially funders, the value of um, the collections and and the best way to do that is to show that you, how you used it so we can track it. Right. So we're All building tools are to for usage. Yeah. yeah. So, um, okay, on to some uh, search stuff. So we mentioned about um, logging in, uh, creating a, regis uh, a, re a registration, which is free. You just, you know, create a login um, for yourself. But one of the benefits of doing that is that you can kind of customize what you see, um, some of your search features, but also you can save searches. So I don't know, you can see, I've got a lot of save searches here. Some of it is just, um, stuff due to uh you know work i was working on like i was trying to clean up some you know so you can see some cleaning up uh, pro uh projects that i was uh doing but some of them are also just like you know i i like to see uh i mean who doesn't all the herpolotypes for instance so i've got to save search parameters for that so you know it's really handy to do that um we uh we also just wanted to show a couple of things where you can um you know, expand. I've actually had a number of conversations where people didn't realize you can expand um, these search boxes and um, uh, get more detail and really drill into exactly what you want to see. So, um, so for instance, if you're interested in just a, a, a genus um, and this field did, isn't doing it for you, then you might want to try uh, just um, searching just for that particular parameter in this field. And you can even hit exact or null. And so there's a lot more um, um, control over here. So this is just to give you some um, indicators. Uh, you can also do spatial searches. So you can actually just draw a bounding box here and query all, everything in a particular place. So you could just uh, click on it. It's, it's pretty rudimentary, but it's pretty useful too. So let's say you just want to drill down into an island of Hawaii, then you can, you can do that. So anyways, the, um, what we also wanted to show uh, was um, the fact that you can, um, uh, let's see, what else do we want to show? <laughs> uh, you can also limit it to whether this, your search uh, results have tissues. Uh, maybe you just want to um, limit it to observations or actual vouchers. So there's a bunch of um, you know, easy, quick things to, to look at too. And so before we get into like any specific parameter searches, we also want to show you that um, while you can do searches and get a list of specimens back, um, there's also uh, um, some flexibility on how you see the results. So you can um, just, you know, maybe you just want a georeferenced um, list of uh, specimen so you can actually just open it directly into Berkeley Mapper or KML that you can download. And then one feature we like is the catalog record summary. So in this case, I actually um, already ran this search because I was worried about my internet connection um, being slow, but it was actually quite fast. Um, so here I, ca I uh, asked for all the herp specimens and then I uh, grouped by family. And so you can see then at a glance, um, all the specimens that we have, this is just for reptiles, obviously, um, for um, uh, uh, group by family. So this is like a quick way for, for a, a curator to take a look at, you know, um, where they have the most. And this is also downloadable as a, as a um, CSV. And then you can, again, um, like I was, we talked about yeah, or, or tried to highlight. Put up the link in one of those. Yeah, you, uh, everything is. We we try we try to have links wherever we can. Um, so that's what this is. Uh, so we you, you can actually see some links here. Um, so we, do you have a choice? I have. I didn't actually. Uh, click on any of these. Open that one. Let's see. Um, 
Let's see how screwed. Every time we do these kind of searches, I always find a lot of mistakes. But uh, <laughs> so that's useful. Carol, you're not supposed to bring that up. I don't know. Well, I mean, it's useful. Well, obviously, a lot of our family names are very old. For those of you, you know, we haven't updated a lot of the the reptile names, and especially for amphibians. And so this is actually super useful to do these kind of searches to see what's identified as what family now, and then you can go into Arctos and do whole scale, you know, fixing of things. Yeah. Um, so this is the default specimen result. Just a long list. Um, that that is sortable. You can actually click on these things and sort by different different uh, fields. So if you click on the GUID, that's when it goes to the specimen detail page that we've been yeah, showing you this whole Right. Time. So any of these hyperlinks will take you to the specimen detail page. But you can so for me, I have specific special interest in geography. So I often have a lot of geography type of stuff, um, but you may not. So um, you can uh, customize your own field um, and what you what's important to you so you can see here there's a lot of different options here so you can I can add in datum you know maybe you're only interested in things that uh, had a particular elevation band so you want to see that in your results and same thing with all of these other things um, you maybe you uh, have specific attributes you want to see um, so you can limit or, you know, expand. I, I don't suggest checking them all because um, that's a lot of data to look at all at once. And I don't know how big your screen is, but mine, mine can't handle that. Um, also take a lot slower, but you know, you can also then also trim down things and then save and refresh. So there's a lot of options here and it'll remember it um, if you have a login. So that's another benefit. Um, I also wanted to point also out- one now, Michelle. What? It's one. Oh, it's yeah. one. Okay. Yeah. So just lastly, I just wanted to show this widget here, which lets you um, also re-query your search results and um, gives you some options of adding in new parameters in your search um, without having to leave the search results. So that's also very powerful too. So um, if you don't want to see it, you don't have to, but um, I, I find it really useful and I do it often. So yeah, any last things? That's the end of our um, of our um, planned webinar outline. Yeah, thanks everyone for attending. Um, yeah, for those of you who have to go, um, thank you so much. And we'll have this recording posted tomorrow um, on the YouTube. But yeah, any last questions before we head out? I'm sure Carol and Michelle are willing to stick around. I have a quick question. Um, I just to follow up to what Nick was asking about the right um, information to provide to facilitate connecting data with the specimens. Um, so I, I might have just missed it, but the so what you need is actually the MVZ colon herp colon number inserted into the GenBank record, right? You're not able to automatically scrape it from a published paper. It has to be in like a GBIF or some kind of other database. Is that right? Uh, well, it has to, when you submit the GenBank information, in order for it to show up to link back to us automatically on GenBank, you have to put in the GUID, yeah, the three-part GUID. I mean, we can do it manually, but obviously we're going to miss stuff. Oh, so yeah. We, I mean, I'm just trying to, yeah. I'm, yeah. yeah. I'm just so, the best way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, the, so that is the best way is to make sure it's um, properly cited in GenBank, and then those links happen um, automatically through scripts. And does it matter? So it would be under the um, specimen voucher qualifier, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so thanks. Yes. you have that example, I don't know where it went. That it is under the voucher ID field. Yeah. So here, sorry. I, I, uh, Okay, so here we're back on GenBank here. So, um, yeah, specimen voucher, right? So here it is, right here, and this this is what the script is looking for, okay. and then GenBank automatically makes these linkouts. Perfect. It's reciprocal the link. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. That that's an important uh, topic, and I, we're really glad that you brought it up, and and people are. Um, Hopefully it'll be useful information. And that, that's useful for any museum you borrow yes. from. They don't have to be an Arctos member. They'll all be happy for you to it's use fun. the good. <laughs> on our loan information? Okay. It is on the, 
it's, it's on the front page on like it says if you borrow our specimen if you're publishing this in GenBank or some other source make sure to link the specimens as our three-part quid with a little example okay yeah uh, it's on the front page where you I mean we also have a whole thing that says you must cite our specimens but obviously people don't always notice that when they sign the loan but uh <laughs> I, I appreciate your optimism, though, yeah. that people actually read the long form. But, I mean, other, so with whole genome sequences and stuff like that, I mean, I'm not sure how people are, what they're publishing them on, or if they're putting them in repositories like, uh, like Dryad, but in there, again, it's just useful to link, to make sure you mention the correct specimen numbers. Yeah, this is a community-wide thing, I think, that we need to address with NCBI and how best they, to... I mean, I think the other big thing that happens that's problematic is people will cite the field numbers, like they'll receive something before it's cataloged, mm -hmm. and then they won't tell me. And so then that's sort of impossible after the fact to, to link those back to when they get cataloged. And so that's what I try to tell people, like, do not publish, like in all my publications, I really harsh on my co-authors, like, do not publish with field numbers. Make sure you have the, you know, the correct um, collection number catalog number associated with it. Not the accession, but the actual, you know, like the MBZ her, you know, whatever it is for that collection. Um, because that way, that's the only way that a different, another human is going to be able to find that tissue again after the fact, right? Unless it, if it's just shoved in your freezer under a field number, no one's going to be able to get to it. So. <laughs> so Not so. that that's ever happened. <laughs> yeah, that happens all the time. <laughs> Oh, again, don't tell us. Yeah. Anyways, any other questions? We're obviously, we're happy to talk about Arctos 24-7. Uh, so uh, you got to stop this when we, if, but if there isn't, um, you know, you know how to get in contact with us. We're happy to um, get emails a bit as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks Great. everyone for coming. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Great questions. Really, really important ones. Yeah. Yeah, and happy great. birthday, Greg. <laughs> and thanks to you, Carol and Michelle. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll see you next time. Okay. <laughs> right. Take care. Bye, all.